Section 33 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern volume two section thirty three selected excerpts by john arbuthnot john arbuthnot sixteen sixty seven to seventeen thirty five arbuthnot's place in literature depends as much on his association with the wits of his day as on his own satirical and humorous productions Many of these have been published in the collections of Swift, Gay, Pope, and others, and cannot be identified. The task of verifying them is rendered more difficult by the fact that his son repudiated a collection claiming to be his miscellaneous works, published in 1750. John Arbuthnot was born in the manse near Arbuthnot Castle, King Cardinshire, Scotland, April 29, 1667. He was the son of a Scotch Episcopal clergyman, who was soon to be dispossessed of his parish by the Presbyterians in the Revolution of 1688. His children, who shared his Jacobite sentiments, were forced to leave Scotland and john after finishing his university course at aberdeen and taking his medical degree at st andrews went to london and taught mathematics he soon attracted attention by a keen and satirical examination of dr woodward's account of the deluge published in sixteen ninety seven by a fortunate chance he was called to attend the prince consort prince george of denmark and in seventeen o five was made physician extraordinary to queen anne if we may believe swift the agreeable scotchman at once became her favourite attendant his position at court was strengthened by his friendships with the great tory statesmen arbuthnot's best remembered work is the history of john bull not because many people read or will ever read the book itself but because it fixed a typical name and a typical character ineffaceably in the popular fancy and memory he is credited with having been the first to use this famous sobriquet for the english nation he was certainly the first to make it universal and the first to make that burly, choleric, gross-feeding, hard-drinking, blunt-spoken, rather stupid and decidedly gullible, but honest and straightforward character, one of the stock types of the world. The book appeared as four separate pamphlets, the first being entitled law is a bottomless pit exemplified in the case of lord strutt john bull nicholas frog and lewis baboon who spent all they had in a lawsuit the second john bull in his senses the third john bull still in his senses and the fourth lewis baboon turned honest and john bull politician published in 1712, these were at once attributed to Swift. But Pope says, Dr. Arbuthnot was the sole writer of John Bull, and Swift gives us still more conclusive evidence by writing, I hope you read John Bull. It was a Scotch gentleman, a friend of mine, that writ it, but they put it on to me in his humorous preface dr arbuthnot says when i was first called to the office of historiographer to john bull he expressed himself to this purpose sir humphrey polesworth i know you are a plain dealer it is for that reason i have chosen you for this important trust 
speak the truth and spare not that i might fulfil those his honourable intentions i obtained leave to repair to and attend him in his most secret retirements and i put the journals of all transactions into a strong box to be opened at a fitting occasion after the manner of the historiographers of some eastern monarchs and now that posterity may not be ignorant in what age so excellent a history was written which would otherwise no doubt be the subject of its inquiries i think it proper to inform the learned of future times that it was compiled when louis the fourteenth was king of france and philip his grandson of spain when england and holland in conjunction with the emperor and the allies entered into a war against these two princes which lasted ten years under the management of the duke of marlborough and was put to a conclusion by the treaty of utrecht under the ministry of the earl of oxford in the year seventeen hundred and thirteen the characters disguised are john bull the english nicholas frog the dutch lewis baboon the french king lord strutt the late king of spain philip baboon the duke of anjou esquire south the king of spain humphrey hocus the duke of marlborough and sir roger bold the earl of oxford the lawsuit was the war of the spanish succession john bull's first wife was the late ministry and his second wife the tory ministry to explain the allegory further john bull's mother was the church of england his sister peg the scotch nation and her lover jack presbyterianism that so witty a work so strong in typical free-hand character drawing of permanent validity and remembrance should be unread and its author forgotten except by scholars is too curious a fact not to have a deep cause in its own character the cause is not hard to find it is one of the books which try to turn the world's current backward and which the world dislikes as offending its ideals of progress stripped of its broad humour its object rubbed in with no great delicacy of touch was to uphold the most extreme and reactionary toryism of the time and to jeer at political liberalism from the ground up its theoretic loyalty is the non-resistant jacobitism of the non-jurors which it is so hard for us now to distinguish from abject slavishness though like the principles of the casuists one must not confound theory with practice it seems the loyalty of a mujik or a fiji dressed in cultivated modern clothes not that of a conceivable cultivated modern community as a whole but it would be very philistine to pour wholesale contempt on a creed held by so many large minds and souls it was of course produced by the experience of what the reverse tenets had brought on a long civil war years of military despotism and immense social and moral disorganization in john bull the fidelity of a subject to a king is made exactly correspondent both in theory and practice with the fidelity of a wife to her husband and her marriage vows and an elaborate parallel is worked out to show that advocating the right of resistance to a bad king is precisely the same on grounds of either logic or scripture as advocating the right of adultery toward a bad husband this is not even good fooling and its local use passed and no longer buoyed by personal liking for the author the book sinks back into the limbo of partisan polemics with many worse ones and perhaps some better ones dragging its real excellences down with it 
in 1714 the famous scriblerus club was organized having for its members pope swift arbuthnot gay congreve lord oxford and bishop atterbury they agreed to write a series of papers ridiculing in the words of pope all the false tastes in learning under the character of a man of capacity enough but that had dipped into every art and science but injudiciously in each the chronicle of this club was found in the memoirs of the extraordinary life works and discoveries of martinus scriblerus which is thought to have been written entirely by arbuthnot and which describes the education of a learned pedant's son its humour may be appreciated by means of the citation given below the first book of scriblerus appeared six years after arbuthnot's death when it was included in the second volume of alexander pope's works seventeen forty one pope said that from the memoirs of scriblerus swift took his idea of gulliver and the dean himself writes to arbuthnot july the third seventeen fourteen to talk of martin in any hands but yours is a folly you every day give better hints than all of us together could do in a twelvemonth and to say the truth pope who first thought of the hint has no genius at all to it in my mind gay is too young parnell has some ideas of it but is idle i could put together and lard and strike out well enough but all that relates to the sciences must be from you swift's opinion that arbuthnot has more wit than we all have and his humanity is equal to his wit seems to have been the universal dictum and pope honoured him by publishing a dialogue in the prologue to the satires known first as the epistle to dr arbuthnot which contains many affectionate personal allusions aitken says in his biography arbuthnot's attachment to swift and pope was of the most intimate nature and those who knew them best maintained that he was their equal at least in gifts he understood swift's cynicism and their correspondence shows the unequalled sympathy that existed between the two gay congreve berkeley parnell were among arbuthnot's constant friends and all of them were indebted to him for kindnesses freely rendered he was on terms of intimacy with bolingbroke and oxford chesterfield peterborough and pulteney and among the ladies with whom he mixed were lady mary wortley montagu lady betty germain mistress howard lady masham and mistress martha blount he was too the trusted friend and physician of queen anne most of the eminent men of science of the time including some who were opposed to him in politics were in frequent intercourse with him and it is pleasant to know that at least one of the greatest of the wits who were most closely allied to the whig party addison had friendly relations with him from the letters of lord chesterfield we learn that his imagination was almost inexhaustible and whatever subject he treated or was consulted upon he immediately overflowed with all that it could possibly produce it was at anybody's service for as soon as he was exonerated he did not care what became of it insomuch that his sons when young have frequently made kites of his scattered papers of hints which would have furnished good matter for folios not being in the least jealous of his fame as an author he would neither take the time nor the trouble of separating the best from the worst he worked out the whole mine which afterward in the hands of skilful refiners produced a rich vein of ore 
as his imagination was always at work he was frequently absent and inattentive in company which made him both say and do a thousand inoffensive absurdities but which far from being provoking as they commonly are supplied new matter for conversation and occasioned wit both in himself and others speaking to boswell of the writers of queen anne's time dr johnson said i think dr arbuthnot the first man among them he was the most universal genius being an excellent physician a man of deep learning and a man of much humour he did not however think much of the scriblerus papers and said they were forgotten because no man would be the wiser better or merrier for remembering them which is hard measure for the wit and divertingness of some of the travesties cooper reviewing johnson's lives of the poets declared that one might search these eight volumes with a candle to find a man and not find one unless perhaps our bus not were he thackeray too called him one of the wisest wittiest most accomplished gentlest of mankind thus fortunate in his sunny spirit in his genius for friendship in his professional eminence and in his literary capacity dr arbuthnot saw his life flow smoothly to its close he died in london on february the twenty seventh seventeen thirty five at the age of sixty-eight still working and playing with youthful ardour and still surrounded with all the good things of life the true characters of john bull nick frog and hocus from the history of john bull part one for the better understanding the following history the reader ought to know that bull in the main was an honest plain-dealing fellow choleric bold and of a very unconstant temper he dreaded not old lewis either at back-sword single falchion or cudgel play but then he was very apt to quarrel with his best friends especially if they pretended to govern him if you flattered him you might lead him like a child john's temper depended very much on the air his spirits rose and fell with the weather glass john was quick and understood his business very well but no man alive was more careless in looking into his accounts or more cheated by partners apprentices and servants this was occasioned by his being a boon companion loving his bottle and his diversion for to say truth no man kept a better house than john nor spent his money more generously by plain and fair dealing john had acquired some plums and might have kept them had it not been for his unhappy lawsuit nick frog was a cunning sly fellow quite the reverse of john in many particulars covetous frugal minded domestic affairs would pinch his belly to save his pocket never lost a farthing by careless servants or bad debtors he did not care much for any sort of diversion except tricks of high german artists and ledger domain no man exceeded nick in these yet it must be owned that nick was a fair dealer and in that way acquired immense riches hocus was an old cunning attorney and though this was the first considerable suit that ever he was engaged in he showed himself superior in address to most of his profession he kept always good clerks he loved money was smooth-tongued gave good words and seldom lost his temper he was not worse than an infidel for he provided plentifully for his family 
but he loved himself better than them all the neighbours reported that he was henpecked which was impossible by such a mild-spirited woman as his wife was how the relations reconciled john and his sister peg and what return peg made to john's message from the history of john bull part one john bull otherwise a good-natured man was very hard-hearted to his sister peg chiefly from an aversion he had conceived in his infancy while he flourished kept a warm house and drove a plentiful trade poor peg was forced to go hawking and peddling about the streets selling knives scissors and shoe buckles now and then carried a basket of fish to the market sewed spun and knit for a livelihood till her fingers ends were sore and when she could not get bread for her family she was forced to hire them out at journey work to her neighbours yet in these her poor circumstances she still preserved the air and mien of a gentlewoman a certain decent pride that extorted respect from the haughtiest of her neighbours when she came into any full assembly she would not yield the pas to the best of them if one asked her are you not related to john bull yes says she he has the honour to be my brother so peg's affairs went till all the relations cried out shame upon john for his barbarous usage of his own flesh and blood and it was an easy matter for him to put her in a creditable way of living not only without hurt but with advantage to himself seeing she was an industrious person and she might be serviceable to him in his way of business hang her jade quoth john i can't endure her as long as she keeps that rascal jack's company they told him the way to reclaim her was to take her into his house that by conversation the childish humours of their younger days might be worn out these arguments were enforced by a certain incident it happened that john was at that time about making his will and entailing his estate the very same in which nick frog is named executor now his sister peg's name being in the entail he could not make a thorough settlement without her consent there was indeed a malicious story went about as if john's last wife had fallen in love with jack as he was eating custard on horseback but she persuaded john to take his sister into the house the better to drive on the intrigue with jack concluding he would follow his mistress peg all i can infer from this story is that when one has got a bad character in the world people will report and believe anything of them true or false but to return to my story when peg received john's message she huffed and stormed my brother john quoth she is grown wondrous kind-hearted all of a sudden but i meekle doubt whether it be not mere for their own conveniency than for my good he draws up his writs and his deeds forsooth and i must set my hand to them unsight unseen i like the young man he has settled upon well enough but i think i ought to have a valuable consideration for my consent he wants my poor little farm because it makes a nook in his park wall <sighs> you may e'en tell him he has mere than he makes good use of he gangs up and down drinking roaring and quarrelling through all the country markets making foolish bargains in his cups which he repents when he is sober like a thriftless wretch spending the goods and gear that his forefathers won with the sweat of their brows light come light go 
he cares not a farthing but why should i stand surety for his contracts the little i have is free and i can call it my own him's him let it be never so hamely i ken well enough he could never abide me and when he has his ends he'll e'en use me as he did before i'm sure i shall be treated like a poor drudge i shall be set to tend the bairns to harn the hose and mend the linen <sighs> then there's no living with that old carlin his mother she rails at jack and jack's an honester man than any of her kin i shall be plagued with her spells and her paternosters and silly old world ceremonies i may never pare my nails on a friday nor begin a journey on childermas day and i may stand beckin and bingin as i gang out and into the hall tell him he may e'en gang his get i'll have nothing to do with him i'll stay like the poor country mouse in my own habitation <sighs> so peg talked but for all that by the interposition of good friends and by many a bonny thing that was sent and many more that were promised peg the matter was concluded and peg taken into the house upon certain articles the act of toleration is referred to one of which was that she might have the freedom of jack's conversation and might take him for better or worse if she pleased provided always he did not come into the house at unseasonable hours and disturb the rest of the old woman john's mother of the rudiments of martin's learning from memoirs of martinus scriblerus mistress scriblerus considered it was now time to instruct him in the fundamentals of religion and to that end took no small pains in teaching him his catechism but cornelius looked upon this as a tedious way of instruction and therefore employed his head to find out more pleasing methods the better to induce him to be fond of learning he would frequently carry him to the puppet show of the creation of the world where the child with exceeding delight gained a notion of the history of the bible his first rudiments in profane history were acquired by seeing of rare shows where he was brought acquainted with all the princes of europe in short the old gentleman so contrived it to make everything contribute to the improvement of his knowledge even to his very dress he invented for him a geographical suit of clothes which might give him some hints of that science and likewise some knowledge of the commerce of different nations he had a french hat with an african feather holland shirts flanders lace english clothes lined with indian silk his gloves were italian and his shoes were spanish he was made to observe this and daily catechised thereupon which his father was wont to call travelling at home he never gave him a fig or an orange but he obliged him to give an account from what country it came in natural history he was much assisted by his curiosity in signposts insomuch that he hath often confessed he owed to them the knowledge of many creatures which he never found since in any author such as white lions golden dragons etc he once thought the same of green men but had since found them mentioned by kercherus and verified in the history of william of newburgh his disposition to the mathematics was discovered very early by his drawing parallel lines on his bread and butter and intersecting them at equal angles so as to form the whole superficies into squares but in the midst of all these improvements a stop was put to his learning the alphabet 
nor would he let him proceed to the letter d till he could truly and distinctly pronounce c in the ancient manner at which the child unhappily boggled for near three months he was also obliged to delay his learning to write having turned away the writing-master because he knew nothing of fabius's waxen tables cornelius having read and seriously weighed the methods by which the famous montaigne was educated and resolving in some degree to exceed them resolved he should speak and learn nothing but the learned languages and especially the greek in which he constantly ate and drank according to homer but what most conduced to his easy attainment of this language was his love of gingerbread which his father observing caused to be stamped with the letters of the greek alphabet and the child the very first day ate as far as iota by his particular application to this language above the rest he attained so great a proficiency therein that granovius ingenuously confesses he durst not confer with this child in greek at eight years old and at fourteen he composed a tragedy in the same language as the younger pliny had done before him he learned the oriental languages of erpenius who resided some time with his father for that purpose he had so early a relish for the eastern way of writing that even at this time he composed in imitation of it a thousand and one arabian tales and also the persian tales which have been since translated into several languages and lately into our own with particular elegance by mr ambrose phillips in this work of his childhood he was not a little assisted by the historical traditions of his nurse end of section thirty three recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey